All right, next I'm going to say some things about motion at various speeds. Now all of us are accustomed to things moving. Cars move, bicycles move. When we walk or run, we move. Baseballs move through the air. Of course, plenty of things in our everyday experience move. Some things, though, move too slowly or too quickly for us to perceive. A bullet fired from a gun, for example, can be supersonic, and it can be too fast for your eye to see. Take a look at this picture. This is an early photograph, and this was taken by Ernest Mach, and that's actually an important name in the history of science. He did a lot of work with uh, motion at high speeds, and the, the term Mach it obviously comes from his name. Something moving at Mach 2 is moving at two times the speed of sound, or something moving at Mach 3.5 is moving at 3.5 times the speed of sound. And that idea of a Mach number to refer to its speed comes from Ernest Mach. But he took this photo, and this was from the late 1800s, uh, not too long after cameras were developed, and he was able to get a high-speed photograph of a bullet. And you see the bullet here is moving to the left, and it produces this shock wave that you see in front of the bullet that is actually a cone shape, and you see some turbulence behind it. We talk more about shock waves and supersonic motion in, in the physics class also. Today, with uh, modern equipment, and high-speed film we can get even more impressive photos. This is a photograph by a photographer named David Neff and you can look him up on the internet. He has a lot of um, very impressive photographs and this is a 22 caliber, bu caliber bullet going through uh, some crayons obviously but look at that. The photography is so good there you can see the little pieces of the wax crayon that have just been shattered and the bullet even though the bullet is moving at supersonic speeds moving faster than sound uh, it's not even blurred in this photograph. Here's another high-speed photograph. This is a picture of a nuclear explosion. So a, a nuclear bomb, basically, in a test. And this is right after the explosion. In fact, this photograph was taken less than one millisecond. In other words, less than one one-thousandth of a second after the explosion. And this fireball that you see is 20 meters across. So in less than one millisecond, the fireball has already expanded to 20 meters across. If you look closely, you can see down at the bottom, this is the tower that was holding up the device that exploded. And these, um, these pieces on the bottom, the, the guy wires for the tower, the supporting cables for the tower, were in an arrangement something like that. And as those cables heated up and vaporized, that produced uh, those parts of the image. But this, of course, is something that you could not see. If you were close enough to see that, you would probably be killed by the explosion. And, and this is something that was, would happen so fast that the eye couldn't, couldn't detect an image like this. You need a, a still frame from one moment of the explosion to see any of this detail. OK, here's a picture of some horses galloping. This is actually a, a famous painting called Derby de Epsom, and it's in the Louvre, the famous art gallery in Paris. But this is from 1821, and at the time, in the 1800s, people commonly drew horses like this. Now we're talking about high-speed motion, things that are too fast to perceive. When a horse runs, his legs actually move too fast for the human eye to detect with great detail exactly what is going on. And the way the horse's legs are painted in this picture is actually incorrect. And in the 1800s, uh, people would get into debates about exactly how the horse's legs should be drawn, exactly how a horse moved when he ran. And one of the questions was, are all four horses' legs ever off the ground at the same time? And they commonly were drawn like this, as if they were, in, in this position. And there was um, a famous businessman and, businessman and horse racer in California who was actually had taken a position on this matter and was in, involved in debate about this subject, about how exactly the horse's legs behave during a, during a run. And in order to settle the question, he hired this photographer named Edward Maybridge. That's, that's actually spelled M-U-Y-B-R-I-D-G-E, but I believe it's pronounced Maybridge, Edward Maybridge. And he hired Maybridge to take some photographs of horses running to try to settle this question. 
and this is this is one of Maybridge's photographs and here you see all four horses legs off the ground at the same time but not with the horses legs extended forward and back only when the horses legs are tucked under him are they off the ground in fact Maybridge took a whole series of photographs all in a row and he did this by setting up a row of cameras and each camera had a little string tied to it that stretched across the track where the horse was running and as the horse ran past he would hit the string and that would trigger the camera and open the shutter and take a picture and so he got 16 pictures here all in sequence at equal intervals and it showed the motion of the horse's legs frame by frame and you can see that when the horse's legs are tucked under him all four legs are off the ground but that's the only time all four legs are off the ground. When the horse's legs are extended forward or or behind him, there's always at least one leg on the ground. Now this sequence of photos is important for another reason. This wasn't just uh, the photos that this wasn't just the series of photos that settled the question about the horse's legs. Maybridge would string these photos together in a device that would display them one after another rapidly so that you would get a sequence of images going by that was basically a motion picture. You would display one frame and then another and then another and then another just a fraction of a second apart and you would actually see the animation of the horses running. And this was the intermediate step between photography and motion pictures like we have today. This was in the 1870s and it was um, just about 10 or 20 years after that that Thomas Edison invented the motion picture. But this was the early prototype of that. This specific question of the horse's legs and these photos that you're looking at here ultimately led to the development of motion picture cameras and the film industry that we have with us today. And you can take a look at all of these images in sequence and see the animation that people looked at at the time to get an idea of the actual motion of the horse's legs. One of the first examples of a motion picture. The, some things move really slow. This is a picture of a glacier. And a glacier is a river of ice. And that's literally what it is, and it's about the size of a river, and this is a glacier in Norway, and it's flowing down into this lake at the bottom. And it literally flows like water, but it moves very, very slowly. They move a few feet per day. The pressure, the weight of all of the ice up top, pressing down, causes it to move, and it slowly pushes and grinds down and cracks form and everything and it can be dangerous. Uh, people sometimes fall into the cracks if they're hiking on a glacier. Snow might, snow might cover the top of the glacier but there's a, a, a what they call a crevasse underneath the crack and um, they can fall through the snow and into the crevasse. But those crevasses form because it's moving. The, the ice is literally flowing down the mountainside and it causes a lot of erosion. Uh, the, it digs through the side of the mountain scraping up rock and dirt but it moves very slow. Sometimes you hear the, the term glacial used as an adjective. Someone is taking a really long time to do something. They might be described as moving at a glacial pace. Glaciers move too slow. When you look at them, they look like they're completely still. You would have to put, put a little flag in there and then come back the next day and see how far the flag had moved. And, and you would see it move a few feet per day. Here's another picture of a glacier in Switzerland. This is a big one. It's coming down out of the mountains here and flowing this way. And you can see the bottom of the glacier is all uh, filled with rock and dirt, not just the snow and ice. It's a scraping out dirt and rock out of the side of the mountain as it slides down. 